Hello, and welcome to the start of a brand new series. In Ultra Gaiden, I'll be taking a look at shows related to the Ultraman series in some way, direct or abstract. It's basically an excuse to talk about shows I otherwise couldn't on Ultra Retrospective. They could have been produced by Tsuburaya or feature a giant superhero in the same vein as Ultraman. And there's no superhero more blatantly inspired by the Silver Giant than the one featured in the 1973 television series produced by Toho, the human meteor Zone Fighter. This was not Toho Aizo's first attempt at a giant superhero, and it certainly wouldn't be their last. Later that same year, they had Go Green Man, and earlier there was the significantly more painful Go God Man. And of course, Jet Jaguar from Godzilla vs. Megalon fits the mold they were going for too. But Zone Fighter was their first giant superhero show on par with the Ultra series. The others were formatted in bite-sized segments they filmed in someone's backyard. Nah, Zone Fighter had actual production value, filmed on proper sets and with a better defined story. The series turned 50 this year, it got fan subs for the first time a few years ago, so I figured now is as good a time as any to take a look at an obscure chapter in Toho's tokusatsu history. It feels redundant to even give the premise because every episode starts with a handy rundown, but the show follows the Zone family, living on Earth as the Sakamoris. They came from Peaceland, which was blown up by the Garoga aliens, kind of begging to be blown up by naming it Peaceland, to be honest. The Garoga aliens soon target Earth with their army of terror beasts, and while the Sakamoris have a pretty robust arsenal of weapons to fend them off, their ace is Hikaru, who can transform into a silver giant named Zone Fighter. Monster of the Week shenanigans ensue, with each episode usually being about the Sakamoris helping a one-off character who gets caught in a Garoga scheme, with the Garogas enacting some complex plan to assassinate the family that usually backfires because they're always horribly incompetent. Being a Toho production, the show features a number of production regulars to help it look on par with its competition. We've got, among many other contributors, Koichi Kawakita and Teruyoshi Nakano on the special effects team, and episode directors include Godzilla series regulars Jun Fukuda and Ishiro Honda. There's at least one episode where Fukuda writes and Honda directs. So there's this clash where you get the weird plotting of Fukuda's writing, and the more deliberate pacing of Honda's directing. The show is up to the standard of television tokusatsu with its production values. The monster fights and special effects look about as good as the Ultra series around this time. Fight choreography is up to snuff too. The show even has its own brand of quirky moments to keep the viewer guessing. As for characters, the Zone family consists of the grandpa, the two parents, and the three kids. Junior, Akira, Angel, Hotaru, and fighter, Hikaru. Functionally, the Zone family is standing in for the attack teams you would see in an Ultra series, with numerous attack vehicles and weapons. The family members themselves each have their own... personality? I think? I honestly don't have much to say about the characters here, at least individually. If they've got a personality, it's a one-note interest. They're not terribly compelling. If you've seen a kid in Toku Media, you've seen Zone Jr. Zone Angel and Fighter don't have much going for them, and in the latter's case, that's kind of a big problem considering he's the show's title character. The giant form itself is enough of a draw, but the character who can turn into it leaves much to be desired. Plots usually call for Hikaru to take action, meaning it's rare for him to have the downtime to really showcase anything resembling a personality. He's got the drive to defeat the Garuga who destroyed his home, and that's it. Kinda boring. They do try to give him a girlfriend later on. Well, they try to give him two. But the first one brings out a little more in him. He's a little more showy and wants to look good in front of a woman he's interested in. But he can't sacrifice his desire to defeat the Garuga, 
for a relationship. In any other given episode, I'm hard-pressed to say there's much to him. At most, his interest in cars is referenced in two episodes. But you gotta have more than a hobby to be an interesting person, I'm sorry. There are a couple moments that, combined with the filmmaking, struck me as standing out. At the end of episode 9, there's this decent shot of the Zone Trio in silhouette celebrating their victory. And since their only goals and motivations are defeating the Garuga, their cheers combined with the imagery of Dusk is, I don't know, it's something. It roused some emotion from me for these otherwise paper-thin characters. Otherwise, I don't really have much to say about the others. There are a couple side characters who help the family, but they're nothing to write home about either. Yes, the characters of Zone Fighter are flatly written and definitely on the generic side, but that's okay if they're used well in the show's stories, and if it's all entertaining. For the most part, yeah, it is entertaining. But there are caveats in regards to how well each episode is written. You got an awe. The Garugas, as overarching villains, are very hit or miss. More so miss. On one hand, their schemes can actually be malicious. There's one episode where they take control of a kid's boat and have it leap out and strike him on the forehead, which blinds the poor kid. They were aiming for Zone Junior, so they couldn't even get the right target, but, you know, it's effective. There's another where they do a drive-by shooting on this guy, which involves shooting out a can which the guy drives over and causes the car to evaporate into mist. I realize how ridiculous this sounds, but I assure you this actually happens. I'm showing you footage. Anyways, they're capable of these really mean operations, but conversely, the execution is more often than not a complete failure. There's one episode where they try to disguise one of their own as Hotaru, and almost immediately one of the side characters sees through the scheme because they decided to carry the real Hotaru outside in clear view of everyone. On more than two occasions, they put a character on a table instead of, oh, I don't know, shooting them with a laser gun or something? Holy shit, so they can just whip out a gun and shoot someone. It begs the question of why they don't just do that with the Zone family when they have the chance. I mean, it would be a pretty short show if they were that efficient, but the point is. The Garogas are utter buffoons, and it's a genuine wonder how they blew up Peaceland. Did they get lucky or something? Zone Fighter, as a hero, isn't exactly winning points for originality. B but he's not a total ripoff. He's got a- he has a color timer that blinks red when he's low on energy. A stylized silver face and body. The show starts with some trippy kaleidoscope effect before transitioning into the title card. He literally uses Ultraman Ace's grunts. Yeah, nah, they were pretty blatant with the influences here. Zone Fighter is kind of a rip-off. In fairness, there are a number of things that separate the character from your average Ultraman. He's certainly a lot more chatty than the average Ultra. But, uh, unlike Ultraman, his finisher involves pumping the monster full of lead. But if he was an Ultraman, he'd be one of the more unique-looking ones, especially in the 70s. Green, red, and blue. That's a fun look. Him and the other two Zone siblings have costumes they switch into for battle against the Garoga that are vaguely Middle Eastern-inspired. I like it. Additionally, his color timer can be recharged by his siblings mid-battle. Fighter is also capable of doing some ridiculous stuff. <laughs> Toho wanted their own Ultraman, and they got it. He looks alright, and he has some cool powers. Zone Fighter is a worthy, unofficial member of the Ultra Brothers. <laughs> but, of course, if there is one thing Zone Fighter has over Ultraman, it's the presence of... Uh, I forgot his name. It's... Oh yeah, Ultraman doesn't have Gigantus the Fire Monster. Yeah, he's 
probably in the thumbnail, and if you've even heard of this show, then it's probably through its association with the Godzilla series. The King of the Monsters appears in five out of the show's 26 episodes to help Zone fight against the Garoga's army of monsters, and it's always a sudden, never foreshadowed, but welcome appearance. <laughs> This show aired around the time Godzilla vs. Megalon hit theaters, so the Godzilla we see in this show, described as a monster of justice, is a continuation of the characterization from that film. He's throwing peace signs and interacting with Zone Fighter like they're best friends. They're such good chums that they even have a friendly sparring match in one episode. I've always found this version of the character endearing, so getting to see more of him is a treat. In addition to the big ol' gorilla whale, King Ghidorah and Gigan also make appearances in this show. It is strangely compelling watching an Ultraman-like hero beat them up, and it's always cool seeing my favorite Blorbo, Gigan, in another adventure. They gave him explosive claws in this show, making him marginally more deadly. As a Godzilla fan, it's cool getting to see familiar kaiju like this. If the show had gone on a little longer, we could have gotten more familiar monsters. But alas, it's only 26 episodes long, for reasons I'll discuss later. The original monsters of Zone Fighter take a lot of design cues from the Choju of Ace. In fact, they poached the designer of Vakashim to make War Gilgar and Spyler, yet he just made Vakashim again, but bug. In my Ultraman Ace video, I expressed a dislike of Choju, and my criticisms carry over here. The monster designs are too busy. They look like several other monsters thrown into a blender. The result is clown vomit. There are, of course, exceptions. I quite like the look of Bakugan here. No relation. And Mogranda is just too silly looking with those eyes to not love. Needless to say, while I don't like how a lot of these guys look, what they do is often bizarre and memorable. We've got your bog standard ones who are just good at breaking things, ones with weird powers, and then there's one that just has a fucking gun. Shadara's design is too doofy for me, but his ability involves replacing Zone Fighter's shadow to drain him of his energy, which is a fairly decent Monster of the Week premise. Even the Zone Marker change doesn't do anything. Finally, some stakes. It's saying something that Gigan is more coherent than a lot of kaiju here. Ghidorah especially sticks out, he's just a three-headed golden dragon compared to... that. There is also a sleeper agent in my brain that activates when Godzilla fights a monster outside of the usual suspects, and there is quite a bit of that here. But yeah, kaiju fights are fun and all, those are handled quite well here, but how is the average Zone Fighter episode handled on a writing front? Not very well, I'm afraid. Zone Fighter is haphazard and usually absurd with its plotting. Anything can happen to get from one plot beat to the next. From needing to enter the fourth dimension to flying into a television screen. Fuck it, we never established it, but the Zone family has the ability to call Godzilla. Why not? Don't know how to fill time? Put in another Garoga fight scene. This show meanders a lot with these scenes in particular. In a sense, it's taking the human-scale fights of shows like Kamen Rider and Super Sentai and combining them with the kaiju-sized battles of Ultraman. But influences aside, I just find the way the Garoga combat was implemented to be rather boring. There's a sense that the screenplay writers knew they were working on a goofy kids show, so they wrote the most insane crap to get from point A to point B. But when they didn't know how to fill time, they threw in extended monster fights and face-offs with Garoga goons. It results in a show with a looser structure where a fight can break out at any time. Sometimes having a show with action in every scene can be fun. 
and Zone Fighter can be fun. But it reaches a point where the action scenes start to blend together. I don't remember which scenes happen in which episode, or when. Let's look at episode 7, for example. The episode starts with an extended monster fight, which is usually fine. Starting in media res is a good way of catching the viewer's attention. But the fight lasts over three minutes long, meaning it takes roughly six minutes into the episode for the plot to actually appear. Ultra 7 had something like this with its first Alien Guts episode, but it was significantly shorter and it was there to show what the aliens were planning. No! This is a long enough fight scene to have been the finale to another episode. The rest of the plot follows a plan to, once again, assassinate the Zone family. But the Garoga pretending to be Zone Angel fucks up immediately and abandons the plan despite how much time was dedicated to it. And then we get another extended monster fight scene. And then the final two minutes are about rescuing two characters who were kidnapped and it all happens really fast. A number of episodes have this problem. And while it means there's always something happening and the show has a lot of action, especially with all the snap zooms like goddamn they go overboard with these, it once again makes everything blend together. The characterization of the show's cast suffers by not being allowed to decompress, and also by just not being very well written. Pacing is the big issue here, and the haphazard placement and length of fight scenes contribute to that. The show also makes use of two-parters, and the execution on how each episode segues into the next can only be described as awkward. The end of the first Ghidorah episode sees Zone leading the three-headed monster into space to finish him off on Venus, but the beginning of the next episode starts on a different tangent. Ghidorah apparently did not follow Zone, and is instead causing chaos on Earth with Zone needing to save his family as Ghidorah goes on a rampage. It eventually ends with a fight on Venus, which leads me to suspect that they were planning for that scene to be saved for the end of the first episode, but they saved it for the next so they could have more Ghidorah action in between, or they shot a bunch of Ghidorah footage first and wrote the two episodes around it. I thought it came off as clunky, but hey, more Ghidorah, that's cool. Hell, there's a more egregious example of how badly a two-parter can be handled later in the show. The first of the two is actually pretty decent as far as Zone Fighter episodes go. It has some reasonable pacing, and the central conflict is about a giant comet on a crash course with Earth, and the magnetic forces it creates will trigger a bomb that's currently inside the Monster of the Week. It's a decent setup. There are stakes if Zone doesn't retrieve and neutralize the bomb in time. Even the part where Fighter and the monster decide the fate of Tokyo on a game of rock-paper-scissors feels like the right amount of levity. Part 2 kinda destroys the momentum by having the Garogas retrieve the monster, and immediately afterwards it cuts to the Zone Trio at the pool. What do you mean, why is he not swimming? There's a giant comet approaching Earth that's gonna detonate a bomb strong enough to destroy an entire city. God, it's so clunky. There should have been more conveyed urgency. As formulaic as a lot of Ultraman is, its dedication to a structure in every episode helps it feel coherent. There's a similar two-parter in Ultraman Ace where a giant comet named Goran is en route to destroy the Earth. And while the two episodes aren't what I would call phenomenal, the urgency of the situation carries over from one to the other. Zone Fighter just doesn't have that urgency. And don't get me wrong, there is a charm to just how random and haphazard this show feels. There's a lot of absurdity sprinkled in there to keep the viewer on their toes, and there are episodes that find a decent balance of the traditional Monster of the Week structure and being this show's own brand of silly. But it's not what I would call brilliant. Oh, Jesus, wow. Yeah, the show gets surprisingly visceral at random. <laughs> I do think the show has a handful of decent episodes. 
and most of them are clustered towards the end of the series. Episode 21 has a dark vibe to it, along with some weird editing and camera choices. The Garaga are actually kinda threatening here too, and they spend the entire episode actually using guns to attack the Zone family. It's an episode that stands out. Throw Godzilla into the mix and it's a pretty decent time. In general, the last batch of episodes are above the average the show has established. The characters don't see major improvements, but the storylines were more varied, and it feels like the show was finally finding its footing. This is where the show gives Hikaru the aforementioned girlfriend, though she mysteriously disappears from the story after the action starts, so, you know, it ain't perfect. Let's talk about something nice. From the incidental music composed by Go Misawa, to the inserts sung by the legendary Japanese intro singer Masato Shimon, Zone Fighter's soundtrack is overall quite good. There is a repetition to it that gets a little tiring. They play the insert songs so frequently in every episode, it's like they were trying to fill a quota with how often they'd play them. But it's all very catchy, and Shimon's vocals are as infectious as always. So, bad news if you wanted to see a resolution to the show's storyline. There isn't one. I've been dancing around this fact for the entire video, but the show does not have a definitive conclusion to its storyline. If you've seen my Ultraman Leo video, you may remember that I brought up the oil crisis, and how that could have impacted the production of the show. It's highly unlikely it was why this show ended abruptly, especially considering the oil crisis happened a month after this show was cancelled. Also, yes, this is an obvious re-record on a different mic. Hi, how are you doing? And Toho Kingdom cites a book titled Ages of Gods, stating it was always planned for 26 episodes. Which is incredibly strange if true, because it doesn't at all feel like it was intended to be a conclusion. Having seen the show, I can understand why ratings could have been low. The storyline wasn't exactly gripping to begin with, and the show took a while to really find a consistent quality. Considering the time it came out, there was already a deluge of giant and human-sized superheroes flooding the airwaves. Keep in mind, the Godzilla films were having spotty box office performances at the time, so even The King of the Monsters wasn't enough of a draw anymore. Either way, the show's cancellation means the central conflict, the defeat of the Garagas, sees no explicit conclusion. So the show ends on this vague notion of finality. At most, the characters are fighting an elite squadron of Garuga, as opposed to the regular variety. But aside from that, the episode's storyline doesn't really indicate an escalation in the conflict. It feels like any other episode. Heck, there's even a plot hole. The Garuga make it sound like fusing to become the Monster of the Week has never been done before, but it has been. On more than one occasion. Very abrupt and unsatisfying final episode. Funnily enough, I think episode 25 would have made for a better finale. Fighter and Godzilla team up one more time for an onslaught against an army of returning terror beasts. Maybe not as it currently is, Zone spends a bit of the final act trapped under a rock, but with some retooling and reshoots I can see this being a more bombastic conclusion than the one we got. As for Zone Fighter's legacy, I mean, his partner Godzilla seems to be doing alright. Movies are a bit hit or miss, but he's still getting work. Zone Fighter, though? Toho honestly seems embarrassed to even acknowledge he exists. The show got a Laserdisc release in the 90s, a re-release on DVD in the early 2000s, then practically nothing for a while until it was finally re-released on DVD in 2016 with a new transfer, which is where the footage of this review comes from. Japan only, of course. No stateside release. Nah, man, here's a Godzilla t-shirt. You guys want that, right? You want to... Godzilla-themed hot sauce instead? That's what the fans are clamoring for, right? If the distribution rights aren't all tangled up, maybe there's a chance Zone Fighter could see distribution on the official Godzilla YouTube channel. 
They were doing that with the previously unsubtitled Godzilla Island. I won't hold my atomic breath for it. Please clap. If there's anyone who hasn't forgotten about it, it's the fans. When you first hear about it, the show almost has a mystical quality. It's like a hidden chapter in the Godzilla franchise. But really, it's an average Ultraman copycat that does a few things reasonably well. I have mixed feelings on Zone Fighter. It can be very entertaining, but many of its episodes are bogged down by bad pacing and weak characters. It's kind of bad in a lot of ways. But, even with its faults in mind, I still enjoyed it, even on this rewatch. Zone Fighter can be delightfully silly, taking itself seriously enough for the goofier twists and turns to be enjoyable. And it does see a marginal improvement from episode 21 until the end. It's like some switch was flipped and its presentation got a little more interesting. For those keeping track at home, that would be the last five episodes, so, you know, it took a while. I think it could have had a better batting average if it continued for another quarter. If you want action, this show's got plenty of it, though it's often at the expense of story variety. And if you fall within the niche of an Ultraman fan looking for something familiar, or a Godzilla fan looking for more media featuring the big guy, this show more than adequately suffices. It's corny, wholesome fun. <laughs> Show quality aside, I do think it should be more readily available outside of Japan. There is a fan base ready and waiting for it. Until it gets a proper English release, all I can say is it's fairly easy to find with fan subs, if you know where to look. Hi, thanks for making it to the end of the video. I was not expecting to talk about Zone Fighter for as long as I did. But I guess I had a lot to talk about, and there was a lot that I needed to establish that would otherwise be inferred if I was talking about an Ultraman series. But yeah, thanks for making it to the end of the video. Again, here is a shout out to my top patrons who helped make videos like this one possible. Fujoshi Urinal, Mulan Nguyen, Ultraman Taro vs. Leo, Irrelevant402, Heya Mooney, Krazak53, Komen, Queer Kaiju, Chronicler Wava, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avok Robot, The Antagonist, Richard C. of Ardon, Kuromori 08, It's God Z, Big Odilo, CMG, Red Combat Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you very much.